Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining me for another restful episode of True Scary Stories to Help You Fall Asleep. Today, we're going to be listening to a compilation of some true scary stories. I hope you enjoy them. So without further ado, lay back, relax, and enjoy these true scary stories. I was watching Cubed 2 with a friend. It was about 2 a.m. We heard the back door open and close. Didn't think anything of it as we were hoping. We had multiple roommates and generally a pretty good food of trafficking throughout the week. We kept watching the movie. After a minute, I looked up across the room at my friends. They were looking at the hallway, so I looked over and I saw a gun with a hand holding it, and that's all I could see. Then the man with a gun entered the room and threw a big red duffel bag on the floor and said, put everything in the bag. I then started to explain to him that he had the wrong house. He walked up to me, put the gun to my head and said, go upstairs and get your stuff. I grabbed the bag and started walking towards the stairs. My friend got right behind me with the gunman following behind him. There were two turns in the stairway. At the second turn, I ran to my room and yelled, we're getting robbed. Once in my room, I grabbed a machete, but remembered that I had just bought a gun two days prior. I grabbed the gun, threw the magazine in and cocked it twice. I then stood at my door yelling, crumbs. That's my friend's name who was behind me. After a minute, he opened his door adjacent to mine and said he was okay. I heard a door slam downstairs, so I swept the house quickly and went to the front door. He was gone, and he left his bag. Ten years later, I met the gunman while in treatment. I asked him to cut my hair for me and let him know during the haircut that I forgave him. I was the victim of a home invasion in the late 90s when I was only six while home with my eight-year-old brother and our babysitter. Our babysitter was tied up while one of the four guys sat with us and watched the dinosaurs sitcom on TV while the others ransacked every bedroom in the house. We lived on a rural property and the home invaders cut our telephone cords and told my brother and I that they'd come back for us if we told anything about what was happening. They managed to get away with a lot of stuff, but thankfully everyone was unharmed. Safe to say, that experience ruined ever watching the dinosaur show ever again. My story's not that bad. I was at my ex's house. It was around dusk in the winter, and I was going to shower and make dinner while he took his dog to the vet. He left and I was upstairs. I brought my phone and clean clothes to the bathroom, off the landing right outside the bedroom, and then went back for my makeup bag which I promptly spilled everywhere. So I was picking up and organizing my stuff, and trying to fix something that broke when I dropped it, and suddenly I just felt startled out of nowhere with no noises or anything. Like, suddenly my hearing was so sharp that I swear I could hear my own heart beating. And I was really freaked out. And I was sure that my boyfriend's condo was haunted until I smelled cigarette smoke. Neither myself nor my boyfriend were smokers at the time, so I knew that someone was inside, even though I couldn't see nor hear them. Nearly the entire condo was an open loft style, except for the bedroom off the landing and an office. And I couldn't go onto the landing to get my phone from the bathroom because I was sure that someone was there. So I tried the balcony, but it was facing a parking lot off of a closed business. So nobody was there to flag down for help. I decided that I was going to jump off the balcony if they tried to get into the room that I was in 
because it was only the second floor. So I just waited, standing totally still, like halfway between the bed and the balcony, and tried to hear something. And suddenly, a male voice loudly said, Come look at this ugly bathroom. And then a few seconds later, there was a crash, and two people ran by the bedroom door and down the stairs and straight out the front door, leaving it wide open, banging in the wind. So I realized that they were in the bathroom, or one of them was, when they must have seen my phone and clothes, because my phone was in the tub with the screen cracked, and they knocked over a large towel rack. Nothing was missing, including a gold ring and a laptop that was setting out on the kitchen island. But one of them squashed a cigarette in the upstairs carpet, which I thought was a bit uncool. The cops thought that it was two kids who'd been doing B&Es in the area, but nothing ever came of it, and that was more than ten years ago. This was an interesting situation to say the least. I was trying to sleep one night, but I just couldn't at all. So I just tried to relax and watch a show. I had my earbuds in and our AC going, but I could hear a noise in the background. I get up and hear my father-in-law yelling from his apartment downstairs to family house. I was going down to see what is happening and I see him standing in his kitchen gushing blood from a head injury. I get my wife to call 911 and get pressure on his cut. He tells me that he woke up to a guy with a gun in his face, demanding money, then hit him in the head when he said something. My father-in-law grabs him by the gun hand and wrestles it away. Turns out it was fake. Then proceeds to march the guy back to the window that he came in from and full on throw him out of the second story window. The house had a walkout basement. We call the cops and they catch him covered in blood from the fall. He denied it. It was interesting because he dropped a bag with his ID in it and a bunch of stolen medications. What was even more interesting was to hear my father-in-law describe to a judge how he threw the guy out the window. The guy who broke in was out on bail on the charge, then cut off the ankle bracelet and ran. They got him again, and he didn't get bail the second time. He was convicted but I can't remember at all what he ended up for a sentence. For a while, it was very hard to sleep, and my father-in-law couldn't sleep in that room anymore because of it. I am still super sensitive to sounds in the house at night, and I double and triple check windows, too. This was New Year's Eve, 2017. My nan had died a week before on Christmas Eve, so naturally, I got obliterated drunk, cleaned the flat up top to tail, got tons of booze in, got a couple of friends round to drink with me, and my girlfriend. All was good. At 10 p.m., a knock comes on the door. I'm too busy drinking and obnoxiously playing guitar to care. My maid opens it comes back to me and says, there's a lad at the door for you. He asks for me by name, and it's a dude that I don't know, even a little bit. I ask what he wants. He says he wants to see Chris, and I said that I was the only Chris in the building. He was clearly on something and vacantly staggered down the stairs of the block. Me and my friend go to wish a couple other friends a happy new year about an hour later, leaving our girlfriends in the flat to party. We get a 15 minute walk away from the flat and my girlfriend rings. Someone's pounding out of the door. I tell them to lock themselves in the bathroom and me and my friend sprint a mile home, blind drunk in six minutes. Halfway, she rings again, whispering this time. The door's been kicked through. Someone's in the flat. Got to the block in a panic, rang the buzzer three times before I got an answer ran up the stairs, and there was the jerk from before with my electric guitar in one hand and my girlfriend's laptop in the other. 
I saw Red and lunged at him, punching him in the side of the head and pinballing it against the wall behind him. I don't remember hitting him for that long, or even that particularly hard, but I must have, because I broke my hand, and the police informed me that he was in the ICU with a swelling on his brain. I never got into any trouble for it, but I was traumatized for a good while afterwards. So now, because of that incident, I don't drink anymore. I was 14 years old. I woke up one night to a commotion outside my bedroom door. I left my bedroom and saw my dad in his underwear running up and down the hallway and my mom on the phone. My first thought was that my younger brother was having an asthma attack. It had happened before and required my mom to call an ambulance. Well, then my dad ran back into his bedroom and came out with a baseball bat. That's when I heard the pounding on the front door and realized that someone was trying to get in. The dude was smashing his fist on the door, shaking the doorknob and screaming incoherently. Thankfully, the door was locked. My dad started yelling back, You've got the wrong house, dude, and cops are on their way. But the guy wasn't leaving. He kept trying to get in. It was about this time that I realized my younger brother, who was nine years old, was also standing in the hallway, crying his eyes out in fear. I was still too shocked to move, cry, or anything. I didn't know what to do. I just knew that I was insanely scared, since we didn't have any type of firearms in the house. My mom grabbed both me and my brother and pulled us into her bedroom while my dad stood at the top of the stairs, yelling at the guy to leave. My mom stayed on the line with 911, The guy continued to pound and scream. The dog we had at the time, a basset hound slash beagle mix, was howling. At some point, the man started howling back at the dog. This is when I slowly started to realize that the guy was either drunk or on something. I wasn't familiar with drugs or alcohol, but I could tell that he was messed up. Eventually, the cops showed up and confronted him. They asked him who he was, where he thought he was, why he was there, etc. He then gave them some story about how a woman had dropped him off and he was just trying to get inside. They cuffed him and took him to jail. Turns out, he had lived in our house 30 plus years ago as a child. He and his mom moved out after his dad died. My parents moved in shortly thereafter. That night, he had gotten absolutely plastered and drove drunk to his childhood home, thinking that he still lived there ran over one of our bushes. He had a flat tire. His car was parked diagonally across our driveway. Half of it was still in the grass. He was just trying to get in to go to bed. While he never actually made it inside, the thing that always freaked me out was that we typically never lock our doors. One of my parents just happened to lock it that night, and his childhood bedroom was my younger brother's bedroom. He had showed up any other night, he very likely would have walked in on my sleeping nine-year-old brother, and who knows what would have happened then. Lock your doors, and don't drink and drive. I lived alone across the street from my family's dairy where I worked. I was taking a nap one day during my lunch when I woke to the sound of voices. My Spanish wasn't good enough to understand them, and my quarter-awake brain kept saying that they were outside, even though a part of it was saying that's not right. I opened my bedroom door and quickly woke all the way up when I seen a guy, six feet from me, with both of my bass guitars in his hands. For a moment, I swear we shared the same look. You're not supposed to be here. Then his eyes grew as wide as saucers, while I apparently grew horns and fangs while shouting, what the heck do you think you're doing? He immediately dropped the guitars and ran, and I could hear the sounds of a second person in the living room, stepping on a plate that I had left on the floor, breaking it. 
I'm still amazed that my adrenaline-fueled brain heard and processed the sound and recognized that there were two intruders. I chased them to the front door, swearing and yelling the whole way, but stopped at the door because I didn't want to get in a 2v1 fight. It was at that moment I heard the second intruder who was getting in the driver's seat yelling, Pistola, Pistola. I thought, I don't have a gun. Then looked to the passenger and seen that he was already in the car, with a pistol in his hand hanging it out of the window. Instead of intelligently driving back through the driveway, my angry self decided that it was better to yell F you one last time, and I flipped them the bird in case their English wasn't that good, then walked back inside and slammed the door shut. They never were caught, probably because I couldn't give a decent description or a license plate. I believe the only thing they took was my iPod. They had put my expensive laptop into its backpack to take it, but had left it behind in their hurry to leave. From that day on, I've always kept a stick in my sliding glass door, since that's how those buttholes had gotten into my house. I also got a safe, so I could move my pistol from my parents' place to mine. Coming up on 14 years since it happened. Dang. How time flies. To preface, I, a 23-year-old female, was four years old at the time. My mom and my little brother, two at the time, lived in a rinky-dink, fifth wheel with bad AC in a generally safe small town. So on cool summer nights, my mom would have the doors and windows open. It was the early 2000s, and of course, windows and doors are open. Well, we had a midnight visitor, an owl. Weirdly enough, he was scared of blankets and flew from room to room, but never out the open windows and doors. My mom spent about an hour trying to get the owl out before she admitted defeat and called the non-emergency number. It was offline, so she called 911. When they answered, my mom explained that it wasn't exactly an emergency, but we had an owl in our house. The dispatch sent an officer, and he tried for a half hour with a blanket before telling my mom that the only way that he could think of getting was to shoot it out. But he didn't want to traumatize the kids so he called the chief on his off day, who just so happened to be drinking with a ranger from the reserve. They both drove right over, and the ranger got to work. He walked casually towards the owl and said, Oh, it's just a little barn owl, as he snatched it up by the talons. Everyone's mouth dropped as he walked out with the fly death pillow, asking if we kids wanted to pet it. After my mom politely declined, he walked a few hundred yards away and released it, The raptor flew away into the night with little noise, and the officers and ranger left us with an interesting story. A guy with a shotgun and an accomplice broke into my house about a decade ago. I was napping in bed, in my room in the back of the house. I awoke to my dog being scared and trying to get me up. And I noticed that someone, the accomplice, was holding their face up to the window of my bedroom and trying to see in. They probably heard the dog and were checking in, but it was especially bright out that day, and I don't believe that they could see in that well. I later found out that the robber was in my living room at this point. I wasn't sure what was going on, So I texted my roommate who had just moved in yesterday and asked him if he was home. He said no, he was at work. The robber was then dumping all of the clothes out of my laundry bag and was putting all of my game consoles, games, and my roommate's school laptop into the bag. He even took my hand-painted miniatures, which really bummed me out. I put so much work into those. He made off with them before I left my bedroom. I saw him and his accomplice as they were heading down the back street away from my house. I knew him as being the older brother of an acquaintance, and I would guess that the accomplice is the robber's girlfriend. I called the police and waited a bit for them to arrive. 
two officers sat down with me in my living room to go over the situation and see what we can do. I mentioned that I knew that it was the brother of the acquaintance and I could identify him. As we were discussing things, we hear the back door of the house open and someone call in, is anyone home? My eyes went wide and I immediately knew it was him. I said in a terrified, stuttering voice, that's him, that's him. The cops both got up and sprinted through the living room, dining room, kitchen, and then ran out the back door and tackled the guy in the backyard. He was arrested on the spot. As I was watching them restrain the robber in the backyard, I saw the accomplice slowly slink away down the alley. I wish I spoke up about it, but I was pretty shook at the time. He went to prison for a decade. Turns out, robbery with a lethal weapon is a pretty big crime. I never got my stuff back. The police had no way to prove which Xbox at his home was mine, or any of his stuff for that matter. I felt so horrible that my roommate got hit by collateral robbing only the day after moving in. No one deserves that. Not exactly a home invasion but an interesting story nonetheless. So, as was found out later, a guy was partying with his friends in a skate park near my house. He got absolutely wasted, broke into the park ranger lot, and stole a truck. He then proceeded to drive up and down the park road as fast as about 80 miles per hour, leaving skid marks from peeling out. Did this until he hit a tree. Miraculously, he didn't die as the tree was about three to four feet in diameter. He hit it almost head on, going fast enough that the truck flew about 30 feet to the side and tore a huge gash in the trunk of the tree. He escaped the wreck. Truck was totaled. And then, still being drunk and now also likely severe brain damage, he just started walking down the road, climbed over the first gate in the fence he saw as was seen by the blood-stained handprints and footprints. The gate was not locked and could have easily been opened if he wasn't delirious. He walked down the path, turned right at the first road that he came to, and then followed that road to the end. The end of the road is my house. We had stupidly left a door unlocked. We're normally very careful about that, but that one night something messed up. The guy comes into our house, grabbed some Easter candy and a blanket, and then went outside and started knocking on the door. That is when I heard him. It was 5 a.m. I was up all night prior to that and had been in the front of the house right before he came, but then went to my room right before he got there. I heard him knocking from my room and went to investigate. I found the door unlocked, but closed, and a man in jeans and a t-shirt, and nothing else with blood all over his head and front. He was looking into the windows of the car in the driveway. I went to get my dad and told him what I saw. My dad went out and talked to him. He had no idea where or who he was or how he came to be there. He just wanted to get back to his friends. He was very laid back and nonviolent, just confused and in shock. We called 911. The police came. Then more police came. Then the fire department. Then the ambulance. He had no ID and didn't know his name. They checked him out and took him to the hospital. I don't know what happened after that. No one aside from him was hurt, thankfully, and we were only down some candy and a wool army blanket. Speed bumps were installed on the park road very soon after this. I woke up at 3 a.m. to my two dogs barking like crazy. Oddly enough, that night was the first night that my wife and I were trying to keep the dogs downstairs instead of letting them sleep in the bed with us. So I'd put up the baby gate, but they had knocked it over in their fervor and were still standing on the opposite side of the baby gate. I came out to the top of the stairs of the two-story foyer 
and hissed at him to quiet down so they didn't wake the baby. Then I noticed a flashlight panning slowly around the foyer from the garage door, visible to me but not visible to the dogs. There was a figure there holding a flashlight and looking around. I'm guessing he was calculating whether or not the dogs were crated and or if anyone was home. In my deepest possible voice, I bellowed, Hey, you in the garage. You need to get out of here before things get messy. The figure didn't move, except moving the flashlight around more. I ran back into the bedroom and grabbed a 20 and a 30 pound kettlebell and my phone, purposefully making as much noise and clanking as possible, and ran back. The only way into the house from the garage meant walking directly under me. I just hoped I could send him this little present before the dogs jumped in. By the time I got back though, he was gone. I dialed 911. Cops came in about four minutes. They were convinced that it was a raccoon or something. A big raccoon with a flashlight? They swept the area anyway real quick and didn't find him. Also, I was very cautious about avoiding getting shot by the cops in my own home. I stayed on the phone with the 911 dispatcher until the cops arrived and stood in a brightly lit room and waved hello to them from the window and confirmed with the dispatcher that they knew that it was me. This happened when I was 10, and to call it traumatizing would be a huge understatement. I was at my cousin's house with my mom and my brother. My cousins were involved in some very shady things, which wasn't out of the norm for my entire extended family. It was dark outside. I was in the living room with my mom, aunt, the mother of the two cousins in question. She's the same age as my mom, so we just called her aunt and the two babies that were in the house at the time. Literally out of nowhere, the front door opens and a person dressed in black from head to toe walked in. Then another, and another, and another. I don't know how many total, but in the 10 seconds that it took the adults to digest what was about to unfold, at least six people had come into the house. Everyone had weapons, and everyone's faces were covered. My aunt and mom handed me the babies, and told me to lock us and my brother in the bathroom and to hide in the tub. They started dragging my cousins from bedrooms and out into the yard. We heard screaming and gunshots, and then things started to go quiet. We waited for what felt like an eternity and decided that we needed to go look. My brother was too afraid, so I crept out of the bathroom to a side window, and the only actual fighting that I saw was my cousin's girlfriend fighting another female more gunshots and I run back into the bathroom then finally sirens by the time the cops coaxed us out of the bathroom the intruders had either fled or been arrested two cousins served time for that situation one served 10 years and the other 15 in hindsight that likely means that these were not their first offenses my dad came and picked us up there was so much blood on the front lawn it took me two years to set foot back in that house. It was the middle of winter in Syracuse, New York. I lived with my friend. Both of us were female and we lived in a first floor apartment. It's about 5 a.m. I'm trying to go to sleep, and I hear a weird bang. I thought it was my roommate going to the bathroom because I heard loud footsteps. But the footsteps didn't stop like they would have if it was her. At this point, my vision goes blue with anxiety. That's the best way I can describe it. I was cold and shaking from fear because something similar had happened only a few months before. But that guy hadn't been able to break down our door same roommate, different apartment. At the time, I slept with a large kitchen knife by my bed and pepper spray because of the aforementioned attempted at break-in. I grab the knife and pepper spray, go over to my door and very slowly open it a crack so I can barely see out. 
for a few seconds, I see nothing. And for context, my bedroom opened up to the living room, but a sheer curtain was hung just outside of my room, so no one could see in, but I could see out. After a few agonizing seconds, I see one person walk by dressed in all black and a hoodie, then a second person with a backpack. I try to stay quiet and close my door, but I fiddled with the lock. It happens in real life, not just horror movies. So they heard me. I heard rushed footsteps and assumed that they were going to try and get me. I jumped out of my window. The first person I attempted to call was my roommate, but it went straight to voicemail. So for the next sequence of events, I seriously thought that my roommate was dead. Just keep that in mind to set the tone. I'm now on my driveway, with no way to get back in the house except of how high the window is. I turn my foot from the drop. I have no shoes on, only boxers and a big t-shirt, as well as my knife, pepper spray, and phone. By now, I'm on the phone with 911. As I'm standing there, unsure of which direction to go, I see two guys running behind my house and laughing. They saw me in the driveway and started to run over to me. I wasn't sure if they were the robbers, but just to be safe, I sprinted the best I could with a messed up foot and increasingly frozen toes the other direction towards the street. We had neighbors we were friends with in a house just across the street. So I run behind their house and try their back door because sometimes it's unlocked, but to no avail, it was locked. So I decide to hide between their cars. All this time, I had still been on the phone with 911 operator, explaining, crying, and also apologizing because I was so distraught that I really thought that I could have been wrong and I'm calling 911 for no reason. Just as I'm about to literally get under a car to hide, she tells me an officer is pulling up. This is within minutes of me calling, around three. She tells me to walk to the street to find the officer. Again, I would like to remind you, I have no pants or shoes on in the middle of winter, so I look insane. I find the officer who turns out to also have a canine, which was comforting. I show him which house, and as he shines his flashlight, it falls on a curtain blowing in the breeze. They ended up basically swatting my roommate because we weren't sure if the robbers were still in the house. They released a dog in the house and after she got out, so that was exciting. But it turns out those jovial guys in my backyard were the robbers. They had popped a window on our front porch, gotten the chance to steal nothing but a $5 bill, left the shovel they popped the window with and dropped one of their phones in the area that I had seen them running to. I'm assuming that's where their car was. They came back the next night and flashed a knife at the ring camera in the backyard, which was awesome. So fun. We moved out. They were caught that summer. They were serial robbers and broke in while someone was awake again. I wish them the worst. I was 16 years old, home alone, 20 miles out from town. I heard someone trying the basement door, which was old and heavy and made a lot of noise and wouldn't open if you didn't know the trick. I called my brother who lived up the road several miles, but he wasn't home. It crossed my mind that it was him there to get something and that scared me more than an intruder. I was afraid that I'd shoot my own brother. I had zero fear of an intruder I had a 30-30 that I got and loaded. They gave up on the basement door and came to the back door and tried the knob, turning and bumping the door hard. I stepped into view of the door, light inside, dark outside, so I couldn't see their face. My foolish plan was to go look through the glass, and if it wasn't my brother, shoot them through the door. Illegal as they hadn't broken the door yet, but I didn't know that at the time. The local sheriff had told us that if we fear for our lives, we can use lethal force and not be arrested. There were murders nearby and people out in the country armed up and things was getting edgy. So he had a community meeting. Murderers were caught. It was meth related. Anyway, as I approached the door with the rifle, the now turning and door pounding stopped. 
They ran off into the darkness. It never occurred to me to call the sheriff's office for help. After it was over, the nerves hit. I called my aunt. We didn't have cell phones in that area back then, so mom was unreachable. I guess I needed my mom and my aunt was the closest thing. She offered to come stay with me, but she lived in town and there was no real reason, just someone to talk to until my mom got home was good enough. Weird thing, I was calm as I am right now while this was happening. But seconds after it was over, I shook all over. Whatever they wanted, they didn't want it bad enough to come past that 30-30. I'm an avid supporter of gun ownership. Some of my anti-gun friends like to tell me that I wouldn't defend myself if someone broke in, that I'd panic, and shooting a person isn't as easy as I think, and there's no way that I know what I could do, blah, blah, blah. I do know. Question asked and answered over 20 years ago. My only fear at the time was what if it was someone way out by chance that it was my brother coming in. He had a key, but what if? That's the one and only reason that I didn't shoot through the door. I'm glad I didn't, as I found out later that it would have been illegal in my state, despite what the sheriff told us. I was about 16, and I was at my 20-year-old boyfriend's house. It was the first time that he'd moved out from his family home, literally the first day of him living there, and he was living with four other guys. Two were friends of ours. One was a 30-plus-year-old friend, and the last guy they called Shady. Yes, it was a very promising living situation. The doorbell rings, and I go to answer it. I see a guy that I knew who had dated my friend. I say hi and he asks me why I was here. I explain my then BF had just moved in. He asks to see how his room was set up or something. Maybe ask to say hi to him. It was a while ago, but I was casual and essentially a way to get into the room. As soon as I let him in the house, immediately two other guys come out of nowhere and follow him in. If you can't tell, I was used to hanging out with sketchy people so alarm bells weren't ringing right away. My friend slash home invader and I were already heading to my boyfriend's room. When we get in, he immediately turns around and locks the door and tells us that we are gonna be staying in here for a while. He did it under the guise of wanting to talk to my ex about his turntables, saying they were actually his and had been stolen. In the rest of the house, my two actual friends were kept in a room at gunpoint by one of the home invaders. The 30-year-old dude was bear-maced along with Shady, who also got slashed across the face. Yes, they were after drugs. Big surprise. After they left, and with half the house wheezing from getting maced, we left to walk to a local burger joint. Shady wanted to call the cops, because I don't know why. He didn't want to hang around after that, so we left. While we were walking, the cops had a chopper out. Not sure if they knew to look for us or just the home invaders. Anyway, I still think the initial dude that I opened the door to saw me and immediately moved to protect me a bit. He looked very much surprised to see me, and I doubt that he wanted to get in trouble for assaulting a minor. Several years later, that guy was found in the walls of a local mall. Pretty sad. He had a lot of problems, but he had some good in him, too. It was a nice summer day years ago. I was at home playing Battlefield 3. I had my windows open for the nice breeze with the screens in. All of a sudden, I look over and the window that is under my porch by my front door pops out onto my floor. I then see a leg come through my window. I have my Kimber Custom 2 1911, 45 caliber, setting right beside me, loaded with the safety on and in a holster. I pull it out and slowly walk towards my window. I'm about 15 feet from the window right now, and the guy is coming in at this point. He looks right at me. 
and I am now pointing my loaded firearm at his chest. It was like this awkward five or so seconds before I said, I'll kill you if you don't leave right now. The dude immediately jetted out of the same window that he came in and ran up my road. I have never seen a human being run as fast as this person did. It was unreal how fast he ran. He was fully hooded with a balaclava on and I couldn't see his face. I called the police, but they didn't find him even though they had four patrol cars at my home and they were searching the whole area. They even used a police drone, but nothing sadly. Since then, I have never had another issue here. Our little neighborhood is very secure thanks to it just being me and my two other neighbors. We all know each other super well. We watch each other's homes and stuff all the time. We all have outdoor cameras and inside cameras. We all have stupid amounts of pistols, rifles, and shotguns. Basically, don't mess with us. With all that said, I was scared to death during the whole ordeal. I didn't want to kill another human being, but I would have pulled the trigger if I had to. No doubt in my mind, I wouldn't have if it came down to him or me. It was just an awful experience. I'm still so angry at that guy for putting me in that situation, where I would have had to live with killing another person, and the trauma that would have brought with it. Screw that guy, and I hope he rots wherever he is. A few years ago, I had just arrived home from a quick convenience store trip at night, around 8.30 to 9 p.m. My now ex-wife and I were about to watch a movie. The movie was Anchorman 2. We heard a commotion in our front yard, and I looked out the front window. The guy was rolling around in my front yard. I didn't think much of it, maybe some kid goofing off or whatever. So I closed the curtains and ignored it. Don't know the truth of it but I'm assuming now that he must have been having a very bad trip of some kind. He started shouting, so I looked out the window again. At this time, he started moving towards my front door. Luckily, it was kind of broken. It would jam a lot and required a lot of effort to open. He tried to open it, and at that point, I managed to lock it. He didn't stop trying to open it, started kicking it, pounding on it. The adrenaline rush that I had will never leave my memory. I have a couple of decorative katanas around my house. One was specifically above my dresser mirror. I ran to my bedroom and yanked it off of the stand. I tossed the scabbard to the floor and yelled for my wife to lock herself and our kids in our bathroom. As she did, I tossed my phone to her to dial 911. She locked up with her and our boys in the bathtub. I then stood by the front door in what I assumed was the best possible kenjutsu stance that I could muster. It's kind of a blur. The sword was held over my head with the adrenaline flowing. It seemed to last forever. My heart was pounding. I could feel my heartbeat in my head and my ears. Then silence. The adrenaline held for quite a while. My neighbor heard the commotion and came across the street with his handgun. The guy had run off. The police showed up and eventually caught him about 10 minutes later down the street. I can remember as I was walking to an officer on my porch, I heard another officer yell, there he is. Then a flurry of get down, get down, get down, as they tackled him through a neighbor's small wooden fence. I will never forget it. I don't know how I would have acted had he actually come through the door. I assume that I would have brought that sword down hard. That mess would have been terrible. The adrenaline rush was tough enough. The come down from that was brutal. The only silver lining that I can take away is that many people think that they have the courage to defend their families, but never get to find out the truth. I know that I have done so, and I'll always know the answer to that question. I reacted and didn't even think about what I was doing. It was the most natural, primal feeling. I don't wish it on anyone. Also, as a side note, I have a severe negative association with the movie that we were going to watch and have never wanted to watch it since.
about two and a half years ago, my daughter woke up at around 2.30 in the morning to a strange man standing in her room. She yelled, Who are you? What are you doing? Stay there. She ran upstairs to our room and said, There's someone in the house. My wife thought that she was having a nightmare, but she was so distraught that I yelled, Who's there? Down the stairs. A voice yelled back. They told me to come here. I immediately grabbed my daughter and my wife and started to run to our room because they had followed. My daughter yelled to get her brother, and we ran into his room and basically yanked him from his bed. We went to my room, closed and locked the door, grabbed the key to my gun safe and my wife's phone, went into our bathroom, closed and locked the door, then went into my closet. I got and loaded my gun while my wife called 911 while my kids hid in the back of the closet. 911 asked if he was still in the house. I explained our location and said I didn't know. They asked me to check. I clarified that they wanted me to leave the closet, leave the locked bathroom, leave the locked bedroom, all with my gun and see. They said yes. I went out to the landing and yelled again. He appeared at the base of the stairs with my gun trained on him. I yelled for him to leave. He began pacing back and forth, shouting, They're going to kill me. He told me to come here. My father told me to come here. Over and over. If he had moved up the stairs, I would have shot, but he didn't. I went back into the closet with my family, locking doors behind me. By that time, the police were on sight. They went around the back of our house and were about to come in the back door. We told them that we forgot to lock it, and that's how that we thought that he got in. As they reached for the door, they heard the deadbolt click. The 911 operator asked me to come out and unlock the door. I told them that I didn't know where he was in the house and didn't know if he was armed and that I wouldn't engage with him unless it was absolutely necessary. We told them to kick in our door. The police later told me that they were screaming to open the door and identifying themselves and were raising their leg to kick open the door when it swung open. At that time, the operator asked me what I was wearing and my race. When my answers didn't match what the person opening the door was wearing or his race, they tackled him and cuffed him. He kept repeating the same thing that he yelled to me. They're going to kill me. They told me to come here. My father told me to come here. The whole time they questioned him and got him some medical attention for scrapes and stuff from being tackled. He spent the next seven months in jail before working a plea deal and being released on probation. We had never seen or met the dude before. He lived over an hour away and toxicology showed no drugs in his system. He struggled with mental illness, was off his meds and had a psychotic episode. Very scary for all of us. Lots of trauma, especially for my daughter. Almost a year of none of us sleeping well and responding to noises in the middle of the night with varying degrees of alarm. We're getting better, but we still have effects randomly to this day. So my house was broken into I had just fallen asleep. I was abruptly woken up to someone stumbling around downstairs. I sat up and waited to make sure that I wasn't tripping. Sure enough, someone was in my house. I ran downstairs butt naked and saw a man standing in my kitchen looking through my mail. I said, what the heck are you doing here? He didn't answer, but he kind of lunged towards me. So I went crazy. I grabbed him by his shirt and twisted it up and wrestled him out of my house. My living room is two steps lower than my kitchen, so we both fell down the steps, which hurt like heck. I was recovering from an accident, so my body was very fragile at the time. I kicked him out of my house and realized that he was very drunk and very high. Well, his stupid butt decided that he didn't want to leave. He kept kicking my door, breaking my potted plants outside, etc., I literally turned on the rage. I saw absolute red and ran outside and I choked him while manhandling him. Remember, I was still butt naked at the time. 
It was such an awful feeling squeezing someone's throat so hard and hearing him gasp for what little air he could find. Finally, he passed out from me choking him. I ran upstairs and grabbed some shorts and my gun. I was so angry that I remember he woke up and I was saying some things very violent to him. My poor wife was upstairs thinking someone was murdering me. She was sobbing and crying and hiding in the closet trying to call 911. We get poor reception at her house, so the call kept dropping. I yelled for her to come downstairs to help me at this point. I knew he needed to go to jail. He was a danger to himself and others. After the perp came, he was talking to the old usual stuff, saying that I was racist and that I'm the problem with the world, etc. Finally, the police show up, and as they're rolling up, he pushes me into some bushes and tries to run away. Well, as he's running, he hits his shoulder into a tree, slides across the hood of a car like a cartoon character, and falls to the ground. I once again chase him. We wrestle a bit, and I choke him out again. My wife is holding the gun at this point. The cops come and I throw my hands in the air, point out the suspect. He gets arrested and I proceed to puke violently, shaking with adrenaline. This guy was on some high-level employee of some very large tech companies. I won't mention the companies, but he had no business acting like this. He goes to jail, and the whole time is talking nonsense. We drop the criminal charges, but are suing him in civil court. That was 2017, and we are still dealing with the case. PTSD from the incident, as well as my wreck less than a year before, just an absolute nightmare of a year. I don't feel comfortable in my home anymore even to this day. I hear things, even if it's nothing. There's more to this story, but I think I've said enough. I was three at the time of this incident, so I couldn't do much. We lived in an apartment in the North Bronx. Two men knocked on the door, and a cousin who was living with us at the time opened the door. Before he could do that, I ran and hid in the closet, right by the front door. I loved to jump out and surprise the people who came in. My cousin yelled out to my mom, saying they were delivering flowers for her. When she got to the door, they pulled out guns and pushed her aside. So I jumped out of the closet, and one of the men grabbed me and put a gun to my head. I peed myself. My mom flipped out and started fighting the guy. He dropped the gun and my mom went for it. He beat her to it and pushed us into the living room. My grandmother, my dad, my cousin, and my cousin's wife were all there. I think one of my aunts was there too. They made us lay on the floor. I don't remember any of the above. I remember being in the living room floor with my mom on top of me. One guy took my dad to the office. He knew about the safe and jewelry. The other guy stayed in the living room with us. He kept saying, don't look at me. But I was three, so I looked. I remember his hands shaking and that he wore glasses that were similar to the glasses one of my uncles used to wear. While this was happening, the other guy started pistol whipping my father to get him to open the safe. He did, and the guy grabbed all the cash and jewelry that he could find. The next thing I remember was the guys being gone. We were waiting for the police to arrive, and I wanted my security blanket. They wouldn't let me get it because the police said not to touch anything. We moved to Miami shortly thereafter. That was 43 years ago, and let me tell you, that day traumatized me. It's my first memory. I freak out if someone has a gun and I start to cry whenever I think about it. Like right now. I had a bunch of other traumas throughout my childhood, and I desperately needed therapy. I finally put myself in therapy in my mid-twenties. I had developed borderline personality disorder. It took a ton of therapy, including EMDR, and meds before I was finally able to manage my CPTSD and maladaptive behavior patterns. Also, they never caught the guys that broke into our home.
One of my best buds from college was a geologist major that ended up becoming a ranger in the southeastern United States. We haven't spoken in years, as is the case with age, but I remember about eight to nine years back, he was telling me about an old married couple that he had recently helped out. He had seen them come to the park for several days in a row and found out that they were visiting from out west and they had gotten engaged there decades prior. They had been searching for a spot that they'd taken pictures of where he'd popped the question but were having trouble. After looking at the pictures and figuring out roughly where they were trying to get to, he escorted them in his vehicle, then hiked with them to where he thought that it would be. They found it and he left them there and went back to his station at the entrance. He said he got a weird feeling once he got back and felt like he needed to wait to see them whenever they left. Well, once it came time to lock up at night, he still hadn't seen them leave, so he reported it, left his assistant to wait at the shack at the entrance, and went back to where he left them. He found both of them lying down, spooning along the bank of the river. Neither were alive. He called the cops, went through the nine yards and went home. The police were able to disclose to him their identities, but weren't sure anything else initially. Later, he learned that the wife was terminally ill with cancer, and they had both unalived themselves by ingesting some sort of chemical slash pill combination medley. They just chose to do it where they had gotten engaged at. My friend wasn't torn up about it but he was obviously sad about them dying, but said that he thought that they hadn't asked for help earlier because they didn't want anyone to think that they helped kill them. I once asked a park ranger for his strangest story and he told me this. He worked at this park in the summer and had for several years. He was driving home, alone, into the park to begin his summer's work, when he heard a male voice say very clearly and loudly, Welcome back. My story is the exact reverse of the others here. I'm not traditionally a ranger, but when I was in the scouts, legally adult scouts had to do the three feather challenge. One day without food, one day without speaking, and one day and night alone in the woods with only a knife and a tarp, unseen by any human. After which one has to sneak back to the scout camp unnoticed by the sentries and report to the campmaster. It was my third day, so I took off, walked for miles through the woods, and found the most remote spot in the wildest, most overgrown part of the woods. Spent a spooky but uneventful night until almost before dawn, when I decided to go for a morning swim in the lake right before taking off to go back. I stripped nude and went towards the lake, but noticed a group of guys fishing so I decided to go back. Suddenly, the ground underneath my feet caved in, and I found myself submerged up to my armpits in the absolute vilest mass I have ever smelled. It was a pit where poachers dumped the guts and leftovers of illegally hunted deer, and it fermented for weeks. Imagine the scene. A group of anglers near some ungodly screaming from the direction of the woods and run there to see if someone needs help. What they see is a teenager-shaped ghoul covered completely in blood and rotten offal who is crawling out of a bloody hole in the ground while shrieking and weeping, then runs at them to get to the lake to wash off. In 2016, my boyfriend, my now husband, and I went camping in eastern Pennsylvania. The place we decided to stop for the night was primitive. 
camping was free, no cell service, barely a road, etc. We did counter to other people. They might not factor into what happened later at all, but they were creepy, so I'll describe them. The first was a woman who had her truck off to the side of the road, a little as we drove past. She had the hood open and seemed to be waiting for someone to stop and offer to help. Usually, my boyfriend had no problem helping someone, but he said this time that something about her put him off. She didn't really seem like she needed help, and usually people who need help look at you hopefully as you approach. She looked like she just expected that we would stop. That's what my boyfriend said anyway. I hadn't really noticed anything that strange about her. The next person came when we had chosen a spot and were setting up a fire for hot dogs. I had noticed people drive by a few times, but my boyfriend pointed out each time was the same car and the man in the car watched us each time he passed. My boyfriend was a little uneasy about this, but we had driven around for a while before finding a place we liked. It had been raining and everything was muddy and we wanted the driest sight possible. He could have been doing the same thing. We briefly thought about moving, but the road was muddy too. If he wanted to find us, all he had to do was follow the tracks. There were some other tracks, but not many. He'd only have to backtrack a little to locate us again. He didn't come by another time, so we stayed and spent the several remaining hours before dark goofing off. No one else drove by. Whether or not those two had anything to do with our experience, the real fear came later. We had gone to sleep in our tent, and sometime around 3 a.m. we were awoken by this very loud noise. I can't describe it very well, or even remember exactly what it sounded like, but my boyfriend said that it reminded him of a chain gun revving up. It was also similar to how it would sound if someone recorded a shovel being dragged over gravel and played it over a loudspeaker. He jumped up and looked out a little window, but couldn't really see anything. The sound repeated itself a few other times. I was so scared that I couldn't speak. So my boyfriend whispered that it was probably miles off and I should just go back to sleep. I didn't question this as I figured loud sounds could be easily heard miles off. After we left, he told me it sounded like it had actually been coming from just down the road, but he didn't want to freak me out. Looking back, I probably should have wondered why he would bother to whisper if apparently the sound was that far off. I was still terrified. Every little thing I heard outside sounded like someone was walking around the tent. We laid there for a while longer, when finally my boyfriend told me to get dressed, because we were leaving. I had gotten alarmed by this, and even more alarmed when he unwrapped the machete that we had brought, just for this trip from its plastic before opening the tent. We quickly packed up and loaded the car. I looked around for footprints that weren't our own. But despite the moon providing plenty of light, I couldn't really see. I did point out something that my boyfriend hadn't noticed though before we got into our car. There was a beer can by our dead fire that hadn't been there before. We didn't even bring beer. While we were driving away, my boyfriend explained that he was nervous that someone might have been trying to lure us out. So he didn't think that it was a good idea to run from the tent right away. He also half expected to find out the gas tank had been siphoned, but that wouldn't have stopped us because we had a hybrid car. We joked that that would have made a funny hybrid commercial. Number of brutal murders avoided by driving a hybrid? Two. We only joked because we were about to crap ourselves from fear and even adrenaline. The rest of our trip, we only stayed in well-populated campsites. Or got a hotel. My cousin is with the Forest Service in the Montana slash Wyoming area, and I decided to go up there to her to literally test the waters. She does hydrology 
and has to ride out to the middle of nowhere to test streams and snow runoff to ensure that there are no contaminants. So I thought that that sounded fun and wanted to do a bit of a tour with her. We were going to have to camp out there for two nights. So we packed up all our gear and saddlebags and saddle bundles and started out. The first day and night was amazing. Beautiful scenery and amazing air quality. It's really so peaceful out there. I love that area, and I wish that I got to go up there more often. Anyway, we started out on the second day, and my cousin said, Do you want to see something weird? Of course I said yes. So she led me on a bit of a side journey to this tiny little ravine. We ended up traveling about two hours away from our actual path that we had laid out. At the very end of this fold in the land, she dismounts and tells me to get off my horse too. We tie them up in this gorgeous little clearing, and she tells me to follow this tiny wildlife path and bring our little rechargeable radio. It's one of those that you can plug in or wind up. And it also acts as a lantern if you really need it to, but that kills the batteries very quickly. I do, and out in the middle of nowhere, there is this huge coil of wire sticking out of the ground. The wire itself was not weirdly large, like some buried transmission wire, but small, like 10 or 12 gauge wiring for a house. It trailed off into the brush and trees, so naturally, I decided to follow the thing out of curiosity. My cousin trails behind me as I do, and this wire, after coming straight up from the ground, is strung across limbs of trees and then back to the ground. Then it snakes around rocks and finally descends into an outlet. That outlet is mounted on the side of a desk. It looks like a school teacher's desk from when I was growing up, with a metal base and a pseudo wood slash plastic top thing. No chair, no building, no nothing. Just this outlet and this desk. I'm staring confused as all heck at this desk in the middle of a forest when my cousin takes the radio, pulls out the cord and plugs it into the outlet. It then lit up and started blaring static. The wire was being fed from somewhere. Now, the place where we were had no road access, no buildings for many miles, and no other people around. And yet, there was a live outlet. Super weird. No spooky jump scares or bodies. Just one lone powered desk in the middle of the woods. I wish to God I had taken a picture of it. I'm a ranger, and I work at a pretty remote desert park. This happened before I got there, but the other rangers that I work with were there. They went to do a patrol during the summer, our off-season, at one of our seldom-used campgrounds. On a patrol, our maintenance ranger found a burnt-out car in one of the sites. The desert is a weird place, so he just calls the sheriff and waits. Sheriff arrives, and it turns out there's a body in the driver's seat with no arms and no legs, just a torso and a head, burnt. Sheriff just marked it as a self unaliving and removed the vehicle. We're close to Mexico, and we get a lot of illegal drug traffic, so I guess they don't even bother trying to solve those. But it was super sketchy. I'm an ex-park ranger. We had a group of frat boys making way too much noise. We came by twice, and at the second stop I told them, this is your last warning. Not only is it rude for other campers to be so loud, it's exceptionally dangerous. Everyone knows that the local mountain lions are attracted to loud noises at night, and these ghost cats, as they're called, can creep right up on you without hearing or seeing them. Whatever you do, don't leave your tent tonight. If you hear anything, don't make a sound. We went back to the station, grabbed the lion pelt from the interp center and the night vision goggles. 
the head ranger had to blow what was left of the budget at the end of the previous year. Once they were all in their tents, we crept into the campsite and made fake lion tracks everywhere. We set up the lion pelt propped up over some sticks. The other ranger got out the PA and from a distance started doing fake lion calls, slowly getting closer. I pulled the jeep forward like we were arriving on scene and got out, turned on my mag light and illuminated the silhouette of the lion pelt. Because I was moving quickly, the shadow of the lion appeared to be moving. At this point, the frat boys were losing it. Jim, the other ranger, shouted, stay in your tents. Followed shortly by, she's coming around at us, and then there's another one. And finally, let's get out of here. At that point, we turned off the flashlights, grabbed the lion pelt in the darkness, and jumped in the jeep and sped off. Just after sunrise, they started peeking out of the tents. Nobody was brave enough to get out until about 8.30. When they saw all huge paw and claw prints everywhere, they really freaked out. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is your tax dollar at work. I'm not a ranger, but I lived on the outskirts of a national park in a cabin. It was a four mile drive from the main road just to get to the property, and we had no plumbing or power. This property was right next to where the park started. To call it the middle of nowhere is an understatement. My roommate at the time was interning with the park service, but he is a city kid. Every evening at the dead of night, I had been hearing noises in the woods but I thought it was someone walking. But then, they'd just stop in particularly overgrown areas of the jungle, so your mind starts to doubt itself. Is it a pig? A cat? Is it just the wind? The cabin didn't have a locking door, and the owners didn't want me to install one, so I began sleeping in my car. Now this is a huge property, and I'd park my car over an acre away from the cabin, and where I was hearing something. I started hearing those footsteps again. I moved out. My roommate, who thought I was bonkers, stayed and still slept there without a locking door. He got robbed, not once, but twice after I moved out. So he finally put up motion-triggered cameras. There was a man with a long rifle who'd hike up the property, set up in the bushes, and watch us. I'm not a ranger, but back in 2010, I had just finished a wilderness leadership class and decided to go to Colorado to get some solo wilderness time. I found out about some hot springs near the Colorado River that were only accessible during the winter. During the summer, the snowmelt raises the water level of the river and they become submerged. And I decided to go spend a few weeks out there. It was on BLM land and I had about a four mile hike from where I parked to where I was camping. The BLM lady who watched the land saw me when I arrived and asked me to just write the date on my windshield every week to let her know that I'm still alive out there. Anyways, it was pretty pleasant out there, but every night I was terrified of the bears. They should be sleeping. But if they aren't, it means that they are super hungry and I'm for dinner. For this reason, I decided to set up camp close to a cliff. It was about 40 foot down to the river, and I figured worst case scenario, I could jump and then get to the hot springs to prevent hypothermia. It's a crazy plan, but once you're out there, you realize that bear spray is kind of useless inside the tent. So one early morning, I hear these loud animal noises coming from outside my tent. They're getting closer and very loud, accompanied by grunting and breathing noises. I was too scared to open my tent. I just froze, and the steps kept getting closer and closer and closer. At this point, I could hear it sniffing my tent. I don't dare move. I just lay there. It starts to move away from my tent, but it's still out there. And now, 
I hear more than one animal. I finally poke my head out, and it's a herd of elk. I swear, though, it was probably the most scared that I've ever been while out camping. I'm not a ranger, but I used to be in a group that's somewhat like the scouts. So we spent a lot of time in the woods and some weird stuff happened often. But most of the time, it was really easy to explain. One thing happened though that to this day scares the living crap out of me. I was a leader for the age group eight to 10 years old and we were out on a camping trip. It was the first year that we stayed on that terrain and it was huge. Normally, we tend to explore the majority of a terrain before the kids arrive, so we are aware of any possible dangerous spots to avoid. This time, it was impossible. Every camp, we have to do what we call a night game. It's usually a scary game in which the kids have to complete several tasks, while the leaders scare the ever-loving crap out of them. Obviously, we had one, too, during that camp. We masked up as monsters and hid out in the woods close to the checkpoints that they had to pass. While running in between checkpoints, I found an open stretch of forest with little to no foliage, so it was ideal for chasing after them. There was no real room to hide besides behind trees, so I couldn't use my flashlight or they'd be able to see me from miles away. It was dark, like the unsettling kind of dark that plays tricks on your eyes and you start imagining things that aren't real. During my stay there, I saw a shadow that was around my size running past me a few times. I couldn't see it very well, so I just assumed that I was imagining things, because nothing was there when I turned my flashlight on. The game was nearing its end, and I saw the shadow again. This time I could see it vaguely standing near a tree not too far away from me. I thought it was one of the other leaders hiding to scare kids, and I decided to go over there, as it was about time to go back. I aimed my flashlight towards the tree, and while getting closer, I noticed that there was indeed someone standing there, dressed in what looked like a torn burlap sack, and had their head covered with a few white plastic bags that looked like they were tied together. I started to feel pure dread. Something felt really off. I asked if everything was okay, but they didn't respond. The only thing I heard was this weird sound that sounded like someone knocking on wood. Nevertheless, I went a bit closer until I was about 10 meters away from this person. The knocking sound turned out to be that person smacking his head repeatedly into the tree, and I noticed that he looked like a male. He was barefoot, and his arms and legs were covered with crusted mud. His hands were in a weird cramped position. I was convinced that this was just one of the other leaders pulling a prank, so I told them to knock it off. He slowly turned his head and started walking towards me. Something inside me just told me to run. It didn't matter if it was just a stupid prank, and I ran away scared for nothing. If this wasn't a prank, it felt like I was in serious danger, so I ran as fast as I could. I heard him running after me, but I didn't want to turn around to look as I'd probably run into a tree. I arrived back at the campsite, and every single person that could be dressed like was already there. They couldn't have gotten there before me, and if they did, they sure as heck didn't have time to change into their regular clothes. Still, I told them, and they gave me a good scare with that. They just looked weird at me thinking I was trying to scare them, and we left it at that. Next day, I wanted to go check it out. Who knows, maybe some weirdo ate the wrong mushroom and might be out there dying from hypothermia. I took someone else with me just in case, and there was nothing but endless trees. We arrived at the tree where I saw the person banging his head, and there was a dead, skinned, decomposing rabbit nailed to the tree. We called the cops. They looked around quickly and brushed it off as a prank from another scouting group or some kids from the nearby town and left it at that. I didn't notice anything weird after that, so it probably was just a dumb prank. But seriously, 
Some people have a messed up sense of humor. Also, I want to clarify that I'm 99% sure that it was a prank by locals. The cops reacted in a way that looked more like not this stuff again than, oh no, evil murder in the woods and we won't stop it. The cops' reaction definitely makes me think that it's happened before. I was a lone recreation ranger in a small district in southern Idaho. Nearest town from the guard station was about an hour and a half away by car. After moving into the guard station, solar power was not working, and I hadn't slept for about a month due to various factors. Bats in the cabin, something walking on the deck at night. The woods always had an eerie feeling to them, unlike the southwest Ponderosa forest that I was used to. About two months into the seasonal job, I started to hear something walking and scratching on the deck at night, perhaps even on the door. Now this district was known for its badgers and beavers, so I didn't think much of it. When leaving the cabin at night, I always had an eerie feeling like I was being watched. One night I was returning from my grocery run, I always went on Tuesday nights, and I had a bad feeling. At the time, I did not have my shotgun in the vehicle. After stepping out of the vehicle, I looked to the right of the cabin, about 50 feet from my front door. All I could see were two eyes about three and a half to four feet in the air. To say that I freaked out was an understatement. I started yelling, get out of here. But the eyes only crouched down an inch closer. At this point, I could tell that it was a large animal of some kind. Definitely not a coyote. I tossed a piece of firewood in the general area, and the creature leaped back a bit, but did not make a sound. I tossed four or five more pieces, and the creature still inched forward. At this point, I fumbled with the keys. Of course, the solar power was out again. I managed to get inside and grab my shotgun. Technically, you're not supposed to have guns in government housing, but who the heck lives in the Hills Have Eyes backcountry and doesn't carry? I went outside. The creature was a bit closer. Still could not get a good look with my crappy headlamp. I loaded the shotgun and continued to throw pieces of wood with one hand. Finally, the creature walked back into the brush. That night, I drank about four IPAs and slept with my shotgun. In the morning, the trail crew came up and we found mountain lion tracks all over the porch, rocking bench, and compound leading back to the creek. After that event, I always heard the rocking chair move, and someone, or something, walking on the porch, but I never found any tracks after that night. Considering that it was always muddy up there, it was weird to not find any tracks. I've been stalked by mountain lions before, and never had that eerie feeling like I did in those woods. I was in the Gila wilderness and a convoy of us campers slash fishers were making the drive on the dirt road from Mogollon to Snow Lake, when we spotted a forest ranger guy pulled over looking in a ditch. Turns out, some idiot tried to make a U-turn and didn't realize the loose rocks makes it hard to stop. They went over the edge and high-centered, were miles from the nearest official campground, and it's early spring and the night time gets pretty cold. We get a jeep with a winch in position and start to pull the guy out of the ditch. Off a hill comes a white dude in a purple velvet sweatsuit. He's got a walking stick, fanny pack, and the purple velvet sweatsuit. That's it. He's a blonde dude and pretty skinny. He comes up to us and tells us that he's German and having a great time. We could not get over the purple velvet sweatsuit. It was a real pimp sweatsuit. The ranger is immediately suspicious, 
wants to know where he's staying and where he came from. It was around nine in the morning, and the only way that he could have gotten where he came from was to hike for hours. The German guy was super goofy and just points off towards the other mountain when asked where he's staying slash going. We all think it's funny, but also question how the guy is getting along with no water and no food. The sun is intense, above 5,000 feet, even if it's only 75 degrees. The German guy refuses water or any other help and just crosses the road and goes off into the woods. The ranger told us that he can't really keep the guy from doing that since he seemed okay. He said he'd check a few campsites in that direction later to see if he made it. We get to Snow Lake and commence drinking like fish in order to better catch fish. That evening, the ranger pops up to tell us that nobody at the other camp had seen the dude. He radioed around, and no other rangers had abandoned camps or missing campers, and they surely hadn't seen a German dude in a purple pimp sweatsuit. That ranger rolled off duty the next day, and his replacement came by to make sure that the other ranger wasn't smoking something that we gave him. We assured him that it all happened. Never heard another word about the German dude in the purple pimp sweatsuit, but it makes for a good story. Back in the early 90s, my brothers and I were staying with my cousin and her husband, who I'll call Scott, who was a DNR officer. This was opening day of bow season in northern Michigan. While I was at least a mile away from any road or trail, I stumbled across an area that looked like people had been camping recently. They'd even built this weird outdoor kitchen. Being a naive 16 to 17 year old, the kitchen confused me but I figured that they had left it because hunting season had started, so I just continued on my way. That night, I was telling everyone about it when Scott gets serious and asks me about what it looked like and where it was. After I told him, he warned me not to go back there and to be glad that no one was there. Apparently, some locals had multiple locations like that where they would cook meth, so they wouldn't blow up their houses and to make it harder to get caught. I guess Scott reported it to the cops, and they got raided a couple of days later. I must have missed it, but the guys had set up multiple trail cams, which were really expensive at the time, all around the area. Based on the pictures of them, I missed the guys by a few hours. They were heavily armed, while I only had a bow and a knife. On the surface, it seems like a well-thought-out plan for some smart people but they weren't very smart after all. Scott filled us in later on some details. Apparently, they didn't clear the images off the cameras before leaving. The images, though too low of a resolution to recognize their faces, showed them not only cooking meth, but also carrying illegal guns and riding off on customized four-wheelers known to everyone in the area. Those people ended up getting 20 years in prison. I'm not a ranger, but my uncle was. He always told me the story of when he worked in Montana. He was a solid five to 10 miles away from town, so pretty much deep into the woods. He recalled pulling his ATV on top of a semi-big hill that overlooked the valley. In between all the trees, there was this clearing that he could see through his binoculars. Through them, he saw an older lady, 60 plushish, in black, surrounded by six to eight wolves. Now, he's a lengthy distance from this woman, but he starts yelling and honking and all that and takes off down the hill as fast as he could. But when he reached the clearing, there was no one there. No wolves. No woman. Only a silver ring with a black stone in the middle. And he still has it to this day.
I've been a ranger in the United States Forest Service for almost 15 years, but this story takes place about three years after I joined. We were getting calls about a lone wolf with a collar on hanging around campsites. Weird. Since wolves aren't known to be in the area. But when you work in the field long enough, you start to realize that anything is possible. No calls had mentioned violent behavior from the animal, thank God. I departed from the station around noon to check out the places that it had been sighted. Wandered around for about three hours. No further calls during that time, until I took a break for water. I sat down, had a snack, drank some water, and was getting ready to go out again when the thing was about 20 feet out, trotting near the tree line. It seemed friendly and had the collar, so I whistled to it and it came over to me. Getting a closer look, I could see that it wasn't a wolf. It was huge, but it was dark and didn't have the right body structure, though I could see why it would be confusing from a distance. I radioed in and reported that I had the dog with me, but as soon as I'd bring it in, the dog took off. Like, he was playing to see how far he could get me to chase him. Typical dog behavior. I went after it, and I swear it was a game of chase for at least five minutes as we steadily ran through the forest. Also, by the way, please don't go running through the forest unless you know the area like the back of your hand. Anyway, the dog finally slowed down near a rock bed slash creek area and started pacing around a spot. I drew closer and didn't see anything off at first. Then I noticed it. The overgrowth had almost disguised what appeared to be bones. I called it in immediately, and another team was sent over to recover the remains. When I went to retrieve the dog, he was just gone. But honestly, it wasn't a priority at that point. He was friendly enough, and I figured we'd catch up with him later. The bones were identified as a teenage male's, died by a self-inflicted gunshot wound to the head. He'd been reported missing in the area long before I became a ranger, and there'd been pretty much no hope of finding him. I spoke to his mom on the phone. She called to thank me personally, and she asked how I'd found her son. I mentioned the black dog, then thought that I'd said something wrong since there was a pause on her side of the line. After I gave a couple of details about the dog, she quietly explained that her son, who struggled with making connections, had sunken into a deep depression after the death of his best friend, the very dog that had led me to him. I think that I spent the rest of the day sunned. I continue to be in disbelief in a way, but I know what happened. My dad was a ranger. He said once that he was out in the forest with one other ranger. They had to camp overnight halfway to their destination. Well, that night they heard footsteps and a lot of them outside of their tent. Then they heard at least 20 people scream, get out. Needless to say, they got out and radioed it in. The next morning, the cop went out and searched and found four skinned animals pinned to the trees around their campsite. I have a friend who's a trail ranger, basically a ranger who can't get you in trouble. He told me about this time that he was gathering illegally placed wildlife cameras and knocking down hunting stands, feeders, and blinds with another actual ranger. The other ranger wasn't feeling well, so he said he was going to head back as it's a one-hour ATV ride. My friend finished up the last one when he heard voices. Keep in mind, he is far off the beaten path. He called out, and no one replied. As it was getting dark, he started to head back and found that his ATV wouldn't start. He then noticed that the battery wasn't connected anymore. He reconnected it and started to drive, but it wasn't going fast at all. Less than a half a mile later, the whole thing died. 
he radioed back basically saying, hey guys, I need someone to come pick me up. They told him they would, but it would be about an hour. He asked if the other guy got back and they said no. He settled down and started a small fire, but before long he heard voices again. It's dark. He's not happy. The voices sound like an argument now. Someone was angry and yelling at someone else who sounded more scared. He called out and asked if anyone needed help. The voices didn't seem to care. He guessed that they had to be less than a thousand feet away. He radioed again, and they said they were having trouble finding what path that he might be on, and they haven't left yet. He asked them just to get the other ranger to tell them about where they are, because he left with the iPad that had the map. They said that he still isn't back. About three more minutes go by, and he hears the voices start up again. He decides to walk to them, hoping that maybe they can stop being drunk buttholes and maybe that they have a map. He walked in their direction, but the voices seemed to be getting further as he got closer. Finally, after 20 minutes, he gave up and walked back. He got a radio call, and they said the other guy was found passed out, covered in vomit, and was being taken to the hospital, but that he crossed off everywhere that they had found a stand, so they have a general idea of where he is. Then the radio died. Then the voices came back. Bored out of his mind, he decided to listen to what they were arguing about, picking up things like, well, it wasn't yours to take, I don't care, you knew better, and so on. His guess was two hunters arguing over a kill. Then he heard the one shout something ineligible. Then silence. Then, bang, a gunshot. He doused his fire and hid. After that, he heard nothing, just his breathing for the next half hour until he saw ATV lights. He told the guy picking him up everything and they called back. They had people looking for three hours and found nothing. They came back the next day with police and dogs. After about an hour, a shallow grave was found and in it was a long dead man who had clearly been shot in the face. Thing was, it was a skeleton who had been there for years. So, either the argument that he heard just ended with a bang and both parties went home last night, or he heard the murder of someone from years ago. I work at a summer camp taking kids on canoe trips for a few days at national parks. One night after setting up a campsite and quenching the fire, I was doing the last check of the campsite. I looked at the lake and saw this lone man paddling a canoe. I thought it was pretty strange, but it's not out of the ordinary. The only weird thing being that he was alone. He waved, so being the polite Canadian that I am, I waved back. I went to bed in the staff tent and everything was normal. I had a bit of trouble sleeping that night, so I decided to go stargazing as that usually calms me down. I exit the tent and see this man in our campsite looking through our tarps and bags. For what, I don't know. Maybe drugs or food, but that's not important. This stranger is by campers that I'm responsible for. We make eye contact and this guy stands up. He's tall, and I'm quite short, so I quickly grab the first thing that I can think of, a can of bear mace. This stuff is meant to deter a charging bear, so I hold it ready to spray and tell him to get out of my campsite. He doesn't really speak, just like, oh, I, I didn't see you guys. When he's leaving, I immediately wake up the other staff, and we make sure that he leaves. We use our satellite phone to call park rangers with our position, the guy's characteristics, and tell them the story. Without a doubt, the scariest moment I had on the job. I've learned not to fear animals, as for the most part, they're predictable, dumb, and not malicious. But people, on the other hand, the scariest and most dangerous thing to encounter out in the wilderness 
is another person. My dad is a forestry technician, and this happened to one of his co-workers. They were up doing some sort of job in the very most northerly part of Ontario. Anyways, it was the middle of the night, and she was half asleep, and vaguely heard something outside of her tent. Then she felt something push against her tent, and the zipper was slowly opening. She opened her eyes, and saw the head of a polar bear in her tent. Polar bears are far from the cuddly toys that you see, and they're known to be super aggressive and will hunt and eat people. She laid there paralyzed with fear, thinking that it was the end. And then slowly, the bear retracted its head and left. Park Ranger here. I work at a park just outside of a metro area, 5,000 acres and a 1.5,000 acre lake. Super busy park, but we have some areas of the off-beaten path. I've stumbled on some really creepy animal sacrifice stuff once because I happen to follow the crows. You barely have to worry about animals. It's the people that we share this world with. My brother has a winter job closing parks. He drives around in a county vehicle and makes sure that no one is in the parks before closing the gates. He does this from about 5 p.m. to 8 p.m. and it's pretty dark out. The other day, he was closing one of the parks and saw a man hopping through the woods. The man then saw him and crouched down and just watched my brother do his closing duties. My brother left and went on to another park where he found a dead coyote frozen solid, standing up as if it were alive. One winter, while patrolling trails, I came across a homeless guy who passed out, drunk in the snow. He had been there for about a week in below freezing temperatures. He was frozen solid and still had a bottle of Mad Dog 2020 in his hand. I was a ranger at Yosemite and passed every day through the gate along the Merced River. One day there was a commotion which caused a slowdown, but didn't involve us so we crept by, just slow enough to hear a man in anguish trying loudly to explain something. It was early summer, but the river was still raging from a solid snowpack that year, and we found out later that the guy was just trying to take a picture of his wife with the torrent as a backdrop. Apparently, he'd kept telling her to back up just a bit further when she disappeared. Us and the firefighting guys were tasked with finding her body. Nobody made much of a pretense that she might have survived. She turned up two months later, after the river had settled enough that we'd started swimming in it, just upstream from our swimming hole. There's this old lighthouse at the park that I work at. People from Northern Jersey might be familiar with it. Next to it sits our visitor's center, formerly the lighthouse keeper's quarters. Last summer, I got put on the graveyard shift for a pay period. While out tooling around the fort, the park is an old army base, around 2 a.m., 
changing all the Pokemon gems to Team Mystic, I noticed that there was a light on in the second floor of the quarters. One of the Interp Rangers must have forgotten to turn it off, I said to myself. So I head in, do a quick sweep of the building and turn it off. I go back outside, get in my car, and I'm about to drive away. When I look back up to the second floor, the light is back on and something just moved across the window. My mind's eye saw a human figure, but I honestly just noped out of there so fast that it could have just been a bat or something like that. I'm not a park ranger, but my friend was, and the worst thing that he found was a dead body of a runner that had collapsed near a trail. It was an older guy that must have had a heart attack and had fallen to the side of the trail so people hadn't seen him. The worst part was that when he called 911, they demanded that he try to do CPR while he tried to explain that the dude's eyes were open and covered in flies, and his body was stone cold, so no. He was not going to do that. This is my dad's friend's story, not mine. It was around 10 p.m. and my dad's friend was driving around locking all the gates so that people can't drive on certain roads. And he's on a gravel road all of a sudden, he sees a cloud of dust as if someone just drove past him, but it came from the direction that he just locked the gate in, so nobody should have been able to get in. He got out of his car and started walking down the road to see if he saw any tracks. He didn't, but he saw this old truck that looked like it was just sitting there for years. Keep in mind, this is the direction that he just came from. He's starting to get sketched out. So he turns around to head back to his car, and when he does, he sees a body hanging. No joke. Someone hung themselves in the park. He called the police and the guy had no family. My dad claims that he actually saw the body. Apparently it was all skinny and blue, and stunk as if it had been hanging for a couple of days. Some people say that they see the guy walking around. But yeah, pretty much. The road is haunted now. I wasn't a park or forest ranger, but I was a historical docent, basically a historical tour guide. And this happened when I was about 15. First, a little bit of background. I worked at a place called Blennerhassett Island in Parkers, West Virginia. Blennerhassett Island is infamous because of Aaron Burr went there with a whole plot to take over the U.S. after he killed Alexander Hamilton. And it's actually a very interesting story, but it's not relevant to this one. The island is said to have been haunted by various people slash entities because many people died there including members of the Blennerhassett family, and sailors would bury bodies on the island if someone died in their ship. Some of the most commonly seen ghosts are the ghosts of Margaret, Harmon, and their daughter, nicknamed Baby Margaret Blennerhassett, an Indian and a groundkeeper. The Blennerhassets are often seen in their home on the island or walking around. The Indian is seen on the south tip of the island and the groundkeeper is seen in the Putnam Houser house. Margaret is seen most often and is seen in a white flowing gown, and people say they smell lilac before they see her. On to my story. One day, I was walking towards a clump of trees with a bench so I could eat for my lunch break when I saw something white out of the corner of my eye. I thought it was just one of the other docents because some people had on aprons but when I turned and looked, it was a woman in a white gown. I knew that people had seen Margaret, but usually they saw her near dusk 
and this was in the middle of the day. I stopped walking and just looked at her. I started to say something to her, but when I blinked, she vanished. I immediately went back to where the others were and told them what I saw, but they didn't believe me. To this day, I'm convinced that I saw her ghost, and it was really terrifying. Thank you so much for listening to all of the stories in this video. I hope you enjoyed them. I also hope that you enjoy the extra rain at the end. Get a good night's sleep, everyone, and I'll read to you in the next video. Bye-bye now.